Arsh Kotinsky being on this YouTube channel. And the, the thing that struck me the most about that Plotnitschke run was, first of all, before he even got on the, the bulk of the run, Modna had already subbed out one of their mm. outside hitters. So uh, Karlitz Sek came in for Petrich. And then Plotnitschke just went to the same spot every time. He went to the left side of the zone five passer and left back. He just, that nasty hooking left-handed jump spin serve that moves so far from the passers right to left. It just curves so much. And Planishki hit the same serve like three or four times in a row and got at least three aces out of them. And all the rest were, you know, three or four or five meters off the net. So it was crazy to see him have that much success with that serve that consistently. Eric, for the national team, at least for the USA, you guys don't have any lefties in the gym that can hit that serve. Do you think that's part of it? That like that serve is so much more difficult because you almost never see it? Yeah, well, we actually do. His name is Michael Sayeda. He's kind of a designated uh, serving true. sub for us every <laughs> once in a while. That's true. Um, yeah, it's it's you don't see it very often, and it's a completely different angle for your eyes, for your body positioning, for your angles and your feet. So it's just not being comfortable and not being familiar with that kind of serve. I have a lefty here in Faco, my club now, and I feel like I have got a little bit better with it because I face it a little bit more, but it is just something maybe like a knuckleball that you just don't see in baseball very often and you're not used to it so it takes a little bit of an adjustment knowing like okay if this is a tough serve you don't have to make it perfect try to fight it off and you know fight off a, a point there yeah good point and obviously Plotnitschke targeting the front row outside hitter who has to receive and then go attack is always a, a pretty smart serving choice so with, with Perugia advancing after the golden set to play Trentino, their Italian rival, like we said, Eric, what's your pick? What's your pick to okay. advance out of that semifinal? And uh, you can guess on set scores if you want to, uh, which we, Dan and I usually do. But uh, what's what's your take on that matchup? Oh, I think it's going to be a really fun match to watch. And if you're a volleyball fan, you should definitely watch it. Oh, um, Trento in a golden set. Wow. I don't know this. I don't know the scores. I don't know the scores. I love that pick. Trento love that and a pick. pick. I, here's here's my reasoning. Um Perugia is down in their quarterfinal matchup in the Italian league. Zero one. That's correct. That's, they lost to they Milano. lost to Milano a couple of days ago. That's a lot of pressure for Perugia to be under, knowing that their backs are against the wall in the Italian league and also they have to play in the Champions League. So I think it's tough. I think there's going to be a lot of stress. I think Trento is feeling a little bit more comfortable just being up in their series in Italy. And of course, I mean, they're great players. I mean, this is a great matchup. So I don't know, Namir versus Leon. We'll, we'll see how it goes. I, I actually had the That's opportunity. That's a great point to, about uh, the. Ro- Go, oh, Dan. Sorry. I would say I actually had the opportunity to talk to yeah. both Wilfredo Leon and Namir Abdelaziz the past week. And, you know, I tried to get a little bit of like, oh, uh, like, uh, what do you, how do you feel about playing against Namir? How do you feel against playing Leon? But of course, they didn't give any direct answers like that. But (laughs) (laughs) it would be hilarious if they did. But I think, like, from like Eric, like you said, from a serving standpoint, like you have maybe like the two best servers almost ever in volleyball going up against against each other. I think it's going to be a great match. But those two guys are players who are like very calm, cool, collected, and I, I don't think they really uh, will be affected by the magnitude of the event. Very good point. And Eric made a really good point about the the relationship and the back and forth of a season with your domestic league, you know, regular season and playoffs, and then also Champions League happening at the same time. Uh, that, that's a, a great point that I don't think is talked about enough. And we actually brought it up a couple weeks ago on the show, I think. But the, the way that players have to go back and forth to adjust their mindsets and their play styles and, and the, the travel and really just everything involved with that, it matters. And Perugia losing 3-2 to Milano in like a crazy comeback the other day, like we can talk about maybe later, Dan, um, adds that one more little piece of pressure. And maybe that's enough because – the margin between these two teams is going to be tight. Like you already know it's going to be tight. And uh, if it does go to golden set, like Eric predicted, which I love, I'm actually going to jump on that prediction later. I think, <laughs> I don't, I think I know. I, that. That's kind of a cop out, but it's okay. <laughs> It's okay. We're, we're always down for, for predicting golden sets. Cause when they come through, it's always just really hype. <laughs> 
Yeah, they've been pretty good so far. Be a good one. All right, let's want to move to the other side of the bracket. Yeah, for sure. Let's do it. All right, so let's do let's do Zenit Kazan and Skra Belkatov first. So this the, the first match to, to set it up. Um, Zenit went to Skra, went to Poland, and beat him three one. So all Zenit had to do in the second leg was win two sets. And just like the first match, Skra Belkatov came out and they won set one. Uh, we were thinking while watching it, like, oh man, maybe this is going to happen. Maybe they're going to, you know, turn it around, force five, win the match straight up or whatever it was going to be. Uh, but of course, <laughs> Zenit Kazan, their ridiculous championship pedigree, their experience, their size, serving and blocking uh, was a little bit too much for Skra Belkatov. And Dan, I think we talked on on the Volleyball Source podcast last week about the the setting numbers and the offensive statistics for Scra in that match. So we can get to that in a little bit. But Eric, you play against Zenit Kazan all the time. They're they're in your league. You play them in the regular season. Um, your takes on this matchup, given your familiarity with with a team like Zenit Kazan, like they've obviously done it all. They won four Champions Leagues in a row. It's a little bit t- a different team now, but. Uh, their, their, their strengths were really apparent in this matchup just from watching it from my angle. Yeah, I, I thought it was a pretty interesting matchup. I think a lot of people kind of thought that Scraw had a, a better chance than they did maybe because Kazan has had a very up and down season, especially in the Russian league. I think they've lost seven matches this year in Russia, which is unheard of for, for Kazan. But that was a while ago. They were they had some injuries, just some not playing well, some team issues, but yeah, I mean, I thought Kazan was going to win this match. Um, Scraw hasn't play, been playing that great. I think Scraw is a great team on paper. They have so many great players, including one of my best friends, Taylor. They just haven't been quite able to put it together, and I'm not sure why. But when I saw the matchup, for me, it was an easy, pretty easy Kazan 2-0, no golden set kind of sweep. So that's how it worked out. Yeah, I agree. That's what I was predicting, too. I think that you made a good point about Scra. They look really good on paper. They had a tough start to the season because our boy Taylor Sander wasn't healthy until the first, really the first bit of fourth round of Champions League at the earliest. So it took him a while to get into it. Um, That outside hitter duo is really solid. Middle blocker duo, really solid. Um, Opposite, a little bit of a weakness and setter, maybe a little bit of a weakness as well. So a team like Zeni Kazan, that's just massive such big blockers uh you've really got to be able to run a pure quick in-system offense to beat a team like that and plus with like with their addition of Irvin Ingapeth just that nice little injection of defense and ball control and you know KG out of system like crazy wacky plays in addition to Zenit's just size and strength is a nice way that they've constructed their team and they have kind of righted the ship like Eric said after uh, an up and down Russian league season. So this was always probably going to be a good matchup for Zenit Kazan. And sure enough, uh, after they won two sets, they went up two sets to one. I think both teams kind of pulled their starters and Zenit ended up winning three, two, but they knew that they had advanced before the match was over. So that's kind of how it goes in the second leg sometimes. So, so Eric, I have a question for you, maybe about Zenit Kazan. Um, during their kind of, I guess, losing streak in the Russian league, like what were people on the ground in Russia thinking like, was it like, oh, wow, this is really unexpected from, from Kazan. Maybe there's a chance for another team to win the championship. What, what was it kind of like being a player in the league that, that they were taking part in? Yeah, there was a lot of talk. I mean, Kazan doesn't lose seven matches in a year very often, if ever. I think yeah. there was a lot of talk. I mean, when you're a league that only allows two foreign players, a lot of the talk revolves around the foreigners. <laughs> So there was a lot of talk around Inga Pet and Bed Norish. I think actually the biggest issue they had was that Volvich got injured and he was out Ah, for maybe a month, six weeks. And that was actually when they lost all those matches. So I don't think people talked about that or kind of recognized it. And then the first match he played was against us and he went something like 12 for 15. And I was like, oh, (laughs) like that's the reason why they've been struggling says middles can't make a difference huh exactly so i think he was a big difference maker i think there was a lot of talk but they're pretty much back on the train now they have won i don't know 10 straight matches they're sitting in third place um looking pretty good 
That's the Zenit Kazan we know and love. That, that That's cool insight. I'm glad we have a, a Russian league player on the show to talk about all that. That's awesome. Rob, did you mention that Zenit Kazan is my uh, pick for the Champions League title since since the beginning? I knew we were going to get to that. Yeah, Dan has been, <laughs> Dan has been, Dan has been riding Zenit Kazan through the ups and the downs. He, he is sticking with them to win this tournament. And uh, he's looking a lot better than I am right now because my pick to win this tournament in a nice segue fashion was <laughs> Lube Chiva de Nova. Uh, they were my pick to win this tournament. Uh, I think all year long, they are the most talented team top to bottom, maybe in the world. Uh, they, Really, I didn't think they had any weaknesses ex- uh, until, of course, they, they lose the first leg of the quarterfinals to Zaxa on the road 3-1 in what was an amazing match. They fire their coach, <laughs> their, which, is, which was insane to me. They, mm-hmm. they, are, they start to be these rumblings of like some just awkwardness and lack of chemistry and butting of heads behind closed doors. Uh, a lot of just a lot of confusion and rumors and stuff swirling around that team. Then in the second leg, they come out on on the road in Poland. They win a match three nothing, even though it was unbelievably close. I think what was it? Yeah, 25, 22, 26, 24, 26, 24. Uh, just a ridiculously great match to force a golden set with the new coach and and all this going on. And then the golden set delivered the drama that we expect. That was an all time competitive, dramatic, exciting golden set uh, that, I mean, we're probably going to be looking back and watching watching that golden set over and over again for, for years to come. So, Eric, what are, what are your thoughts? You made a video on this, which was awesome. Uh, <laughs> I did. You, you've, you've, you've watched this match. You, you know some of the players. You just kind of know the styles of the two teams. Um, it, it's crazy that after Lube wins this match three nothing that they can get that they can turn around and get beat by such a narrow margin. Then they go home and they're done for the tournament. It was amazing. Yeah, I mean, incredible series. I think the series of the quarterfinals for sure. I some of the most entertaining volleyball I've seen in a long time. I I actually thought that Zoxa had a chance. I'm not. I won't lie, and I, I'm I'm honestly saying that before I watch these matches. I thought Zoxa had a chance because they bring just a different style and a different type of volleyball than almost anyone in the world is used to. I think Lube is very used to Italian volleyball, which is beautiful volleyball, power and finesse and strategy, of course. But Zoxa brings this like sneakiness and tips and roll shots and variety that nobody else sees and nobody else really does. I think there's a lot of it in the Polish league, but it was an interesting matchup and you could, it was a very good learning experience to watch it in my opinion. I think Zaxa exposed a lot of things to watch for in the future. And to me, they were just scrappy and just wouldn't go away. And that really bothered Lube because they're kind of used to opponents just giving up almost. That's a good point. Even the set that Lube won when they lost the match 3-1 in the previous leg, the set they won was like 25-14. So once they got on... You know, once they started feeling themselves, got up by three or four points, they were able to just keep their foot on the gas. But Zaxa just didn't let them do that in the second leg, even though they they lost three sets to none in the match before. They were all so close. They were pushing Lube to their limits. And so I wanted to ask, like, tactically about the fact that both of those teams, but uh, Zaxa especially, when their setters are front row in their in blocking situations out of system against left side attack, when most teams would go up and put three blockers up there, both of them, but especially with Tony Udi, they would pull the shorter setter out of the block completely. And they would bring the left side blocker and the middle blocker and just put two guys up against that outside hitter and just kind of let Tony Udi roam around and play for short shots as a defender you and probably position five. Most of the time, what do you think about that? Have you seen that before has like what adjustments have to be made defensively and why is Zaxa able to make that work? You know, I don't know if I've seen that in men's volleyball before a a whole ton. I know France does it a little bit just because it's Tony UT again. It is used more in women's volleyball. You'll see it used fairly often, but not triple blocks are pretty popular in women's volleyball as well. I think as a defender, it's just something that takes practice. And it's obviously something they do day in and day out, finding space around the block, I think. When you have a smaller blocker up there as a defender, there's times where you don't know where to go. You know, it's like, do you go up for tip 
or do you get deep because he's a small blocker and these hitters can go over you? So I think taking Tony T out kind of eliminates this, a little bit of uncertainty in the defense. Those defenders are now all very deep. Tony UT is getting the tip and they can kind of cover a little bit more ground like that. And you'll see teams using three block blocks less and less these days because th- the hitters are so used to three blocks that it kind of throws them off. So I think it's an interesting strategy and one that's obviously working. I mean, they haven't lost very many matches at all this season. Yeah, they've been pretty untouchable in Poland. I, I love hearing that analysis. You're right about taking a little bit of the uncertainty element out of it. Just whatever you you know what you're getting and you know where to set up defensively so you made it you made a point about zox's style the the style of volleyball that they play and that's something that we've talked about a lot on this show and so i I promise there's a question at at, at the end of of this little (laughs) spiel so we one of the things that i've been talking about uh, mostly zox's style because they're a great example is that the difference between club and national team for me is that a lot of the national teams, a lot of them have these strongly defined team identities, you know, because there's not nearly as much roster tone or turnover. Guys are coming back year after year. The the style that the national team wants to play, it like permeates down all the way through the youth levels. They're developing players that they fit, that they think is going to, are going to fit their systems. Like, you know, that Italian volleyball, like you said, is beautiful, technical, fast. You know, that Russian volleyball is Big, powerful, massive size, blocking and serving. Uh, but club, you, it's it's more rare to get teams that have those strongly defined identities because there's so much turnover year over year. Um, I'm, I don't actually know. I, you play club, I don't. So like the maybe it, maybe it's coaching, maybe it's the way the organizations are set up. But I wanted to ask about that. Why you think this Zaxa team, and just because they're the best example in my opinion, has such this this identifiable and easy to, to point out style of play that they have. I think it's clearly an example of the team being greater than the sum of the individual players, just because they're so on the same page with the level of volleyball and the style of volleyball that they want to play that we don't always see in the club game. And it's been so much fun for me to watch this year. So what do you think about that having played national team and club for so many years? Yeah, I think that's a great point. I I think one thing to say is that team has played together, like a lot of that team has been playing together for a while. So they do know each other and their styles and they've kind of had the time to groove it out a little bit. So I love watching them play. I think it's uh, it's a very creative style. It's a new style. It's exciting and it's something different. I I don't know if it's team based. I think it's a lot of individual based. I think Schliefka is a very creative player. I think that Tony Uti is one of the best in the business when it comes to setter. I think Cosmetic has a very interesting style in the opposite. So I think it is these individuals having these styles and then coming together and then it all kind of working together. So It's interesting. I'm not sure if it's a team. I'm not sure if it's a club identity. I think it's almost more individual. And the fact that these players are creative and different and then all came together kind of allows the whole team to be creative and different as well. Yeah. and Very interesting. I I love that point. And yeah, I agree with Eric. Like, I think, but I think the main thing, the main, you know, anchor around all this, as you guys mentioned, is Ben Taniyuti has been there for so long. Like he is... And having the setter, too, as the player that's been there the longest. I think he's been there for six years. So I think having continuity in club volleyball volleyball especially is pretty rare. So to have one player in your setter being there for that long, I think, instills a team culture that, you know, is tough to replicate any other way. Yeah, and I think if, you know, say there's a new outside coming in, they're not saying, oh, you're on Zoxa now, you need to start tipping into the block or you need to have a certain style. I think he's watching Schliefka be successful with this very unique lefty tipping, jousting, all kinds of crazy style and saying, oh, I could learn from that. So I'm going to adapt my ways a little bit this season. So then it all kind of just starts looking similar. And I think um, Semenyuk as opposite of Shlifka on the outside is is a great um, duo because he's a little bit more power, a little bit more high ball. And they're just working really well together and they're super fun to watch. Semenyuk is a monster. He's made a name for himself this season. Yeah, I had never heard of that guy, I'll be honest, before this season. (laughs) Most of us hadn't. It was crazy. 
All right. so there's so there's two more two more things I want to ask about this match really quickly. One is the one-handed stab that Pavel Zatorski made. Oh God, yeah, I threw a lot of pens on that play on my video. <laughs> <laughs> how how do you make that play as one of the uh, I don't know, top three um, two or three barrows in the world? How do you make I that don't play? Know. You know what's funny is that I've actually been working on a little bit more one hand stuff in practice the last couple of weeks. <laughs> and that one almost, it kind of inspired me to, to work on it, but it's just instinct. It's him being a baller. It's him being digging a thousand ball, million balls in his life. And um, there's a little bit of technique to it, you know, not bringing your platform together, but most of it is just instinct and reaction and just being a sick libero and sick player. Well said. And just controlling it for the most part. I mean, it was honestly, and I, sorry, Zatorski out there. It, it might have been a little luck, I think. For sure. <laughs> Sometimes For we sure dig these balls and we're like, oh, how did, how, did, how did that happen? Like, honestly, but sick play, sick play. Wasn't that surprised that it happened. And then now Zaxa advancing to play Zeni Kazan. Uh, a, a, a very different styles, extremely different styles. <laughs> yes. Uh, what what are what are your picks for that matchup? Oh, you guys are killing me. I don't. <laughs> I, I, you know, oh, like you said, Russia is all about serving and blocking, and I'm super interested to see how you know the craftiness of Zaxa, how that's going to work against Zenit's block, where Volvich is seven one, uh, Volkov is seven feet. You know, they're just huge. So. He, they can block these balls just standing there. So it'll be interesting to watch. Um, oh, I should choose a Russian team because I live here. I'm going to go Zaxa, Golden. <laughs> um, <laughs> Tough one. Dave, Dave Smith Ooh. is on Zaxa, one of my closest friends. Oh, God. Um, my, okay. Sorry, Dave. I'm going to go Kazan, Golden Set. Nice. I, I'm so here for these golden set picks. If we have if we have two more golden sets in each of the semifinals, that would be the best thing ever. Again, a mini a so mini awesome. cop out by me by saying golden set, but <sighs> but I actually think it's kind of a corporate choice because we all all we want over here is for golden that's sets. That's what to happen we want to see. <laughs> I, we that's what we live for volleyball for. That's what we want. Don't you guys think, though, and Sineric in the chat brought up a good point that Engaped is kind of like exactly this unorthodox tipping. Uh, style that that Zaxa embolizes. That's kind of what I brought up earlier, and that he's that one you know injection of different style into the Zenit Kazan thing because they're also yeah, yeah. big, massive, you know, serve hard, block a lot of balls. But he is, but we've talked about this by far the best position six defender in the world, and then just does all these wacky, ridiculous things that nobody expects. It's it's a little bit different from the Zaxa style, in my opinion, because Ingapeth is always trying to score. The, the, the Zaxa guys on the pins, we've talked about how good they are at the recycle, at the tip into the block, the, the, the high hand swing, just doing the smart thing, not necessarily trying to score every time they touch the ball, but always trying to get ahead in the point. I think that Ingapeth is pretty much always trying to score when he gets the ball, but it, it is similar in, in how different it is from the standard Zenit Kazan style of play. So the Ingapeth against Zaxa in particular it's going to be really cool to watch. All right, Rob. Yeah, I think <laughs> what's Rob your prediction? Hit, oh, I think Rob hit it on the head. Sorry to interrupt. No, I no, no. Go, go for it. Whoever brought that up in the chat, you know, there's not two ways of playing volleyball. There's 20. I don't know. And the way Zaxa or maybe Shlupka is doing it is similar to Inga Pet in that it's different, like Rob said, but it's not the same. And I can say that as a player that's played against both. It, it's it's not the same and I can't put my finger on it exactly what what the difference is but it's not so again creative different fun um, unique but different different ball games all right want to go on record with our picks Dan yeah let's do it so I like I like Zaxa and I think they're a great team and like something special this year that we're gonna look back on in a few years and be like, wow, that Zaxa like 2021 team was like how how did they how do they do it? But I mean I'm gonna have to stick with my pick here. I think Zeneca Zahn's got that championship experience. That block is even bigger than the Blue Bay block. So I'm gonna take uh, I'm gonna take Zach or Zeneca Zahn uh, three two three one. 
I'm going to pick Zaxa by the exact same score. Three, I two, think three, I think Zaxa oh, I think Zaxa it. wins three two on the road. I think they win three one at home. I th- we've been talking in the chat over the past few weeks. Like, does Zaxa have a chance to win this tournament? Uh, for a while, th- that I-, I was less on board with that possibility than obviously I am now because they beat the defending champions they had this impossible draw but they have been proving to me more and more that their style matches up better against the the traditionally successful styles than i expected i think they have a chance to win this tournament and i think that they will beat zenit kazan in the semifinals and i think it's going to be really close all right so eric i think sorry there you go, interrupt go, go, one more time go, 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 go. i think another interesting thing to watch will be bed norris she's polish it's his first year in, in Kazan. He's had an up and down. I mean, he, he's a very good player. He's had a very up and down year with the club and with the coach. And now he's going to be playing against a Polish team. Um, against Shlivka and Semenuk. They're all kind of competitors for the Olympics. There's just a lot of layers to this match. And I think it'll be really fun to watch. That is a very spicy storyline indeed. I love that. We've been talking about like, what on earth is Vital Heinen going to do for the Polish national team roster for Tokyo, just with all these options that he has? That's something that we've talked about before, and I'm glad you brought that up because that's going to be an interesting head-to-head to watch. For sure. And, and that starts, everyone. You can watch it on Eurovolley TV next Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday is the next round of Champions League matches. And Eric, we want to do two quick things before we let you go here. One, I just want to know how the season in Russia is going. Yeah, I mean, season is going pretty well. I, like I said, I play for Falco and Ovi Udengoy. We are currently in fifth place with one more regular season match to go. The, the way playoffs work here is that it's actually a final six format with two pools of three, but you have to play one round of playoffs, a two out of three series to get into the final six. So we'll have one more regular season game and then we're going to play a playoff season uh series and then hopefully make it to final six but we're in fifth um i'll just go down the line dinamo moscow is number one kuzbas kamarovo is number two zenit kazan is number three zenit st peter petersburg is four we're five and novosibirsk is six but there has been a lot of change and wins and losses i think it could be anyone's game come down to final six for sure i have a question about that because russia Russia's is very interesting league to me. First of all, I think this might be the first year when they've really opened up the ability to consume that league. They're streaming a lot of matches on YouTube for free. It's just more accessible than it's ever been, which I think is awesome. And also the depth of good teams in the league, I think is at an all time high. All six of those teams that you just mentioned, Eric, yours included is very, very, very good volleyball teams. It used to be just kind of Zenit Kazan and then one other team that would catch lightning in a bottle for that season. But now it, there's so much, there's, there are so many legitimately good Russian club teams. What do you think now that you've been there for two years, do you think there's a reason for that? Like, is there, something that you can put your finger on as to why the caliber of the Russian league top to bottom has gotten so good? Well, I mean, I'm going to correct you, Rob. This is my fourth season in Russia. Ah, that's right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think Russian youth volleyball is just like a factory for young volleyball players. Every team has a junior team. And then under the junior team, there's like a youth team. So under my Fakel team, the senior team, there's probably 20 to 25 younger players that are all trying to get up to the top league. So I think it's just becoming more popular and more and more players are coming. These guys are huge. These guys are strong. They're like 14 to 18. And I look back on my 14 year old self and I'm like, "Hmm, I did not look like that kind of thing. (laughs) So they're just pumping out volleyball players. It's getting more popular. More and more players are playing and it's showing in the depth of the league. I think, um, if I'm going to talk about our results against those other teams, you know, we were the only team that's beat Moscow this season twice. We lost to Kuzbas in five twice. We lost to Kazan in five twice. We beat St. Petersburg twice and we beat Nova Sabirs twice. So there's a lot of parity. I think come final six, you know, it's all about one or two matches and who can play well for those matches. So I think it's going to be really interesting if, you know, we can all make it there because there is a round of playoffs before that. Very well said that the, the parity is at an all-time high. It might be the most of any league that there is out there right now. Poland is clearly dominated by Zaxa. Uh, Italy, it's kind of a three-horse race. But Russia, I mean, any of those six, 
could easily win the championship. Like Eric said, that the regular season results have been so just so competitive. It's awesome. I'm so happy that it's that that's the case in Russia right now. Yeah, it, it's it's definitely one of those things. It's like a good challenge. It's one of it's like, well, can't we just have an easy game every once in a while? But no, <laughs> you know, every match is a challenge. I think Dinamo has obviously had the the season so far. They've only had two losses, which were us. If I'm saying gonna say that again, but mm-hmm. they're looking really strong. They're playing really well together and I think they're the team to beat right now. All right, Eric. And one more question before we move on from Russia. Is there like a player on uh, Novi Uringoy who casual or like non-Russian volleyball fans might not have heard of, but you think like deserves more recognition? Ooh. Um, let's see. I mean, I think everyone knows Dmitry Volkov. He's an outside for Russia. And so that's not like a new one. He's a great player. I think our other outside, his name is Dennis Bogdan. He's twenty. Three, I believe, up and comer. To me, he could definitely be on the national team soon. He'll be a force to reckon with in the league for a long time. And I look forward to seeing him on the national team very, very soon. So pay attention to him. Yeah, he's really good. And it was a shame, kind of, I mean, Igor Kluka was amazing as well, but it's a shame seeing a player like Dennis Bogdan, who, who showed really good flashes last year as well, uh, sitting on the bench. And last topic here for you, Eric. Yeah. People may not know, but you're, or probably a lot of volleyball fans know, but you're like a, a huge YouTube star now, I have to say. Uh, <laughs> a huge one, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, it's certainly, it's certainly growing fast, and I, I love your content. I'm sure many of the people watching have been able to check it out, and if you haven't, the channel's called Eric Shoji, right? Yeah, it's just my name. Yeah, so how did, how did you come up with that idea? What inspired you to start it? Can you talk a, a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I think like anybody on YouTube these days, you're seeing these reaction videos, whether it's to sports or video games or singing or dancing, people are reacting. And I, when COVID hit last, you know, March, I kind of looked around YouTube and I said, hey, nobody's doing this. Like there's a little bit of a gap here for volleyball fans. I think volleyball is super popular all around the world. I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge nerd. And I said, okay, you know what? I want to do this. And I was in Hawaii all of COVID. So I was kind of like, eh, I'm not going to do it now. I'm outside. The restrictions aren't that tough. I got to Russia. I got COVID in October. So I was inside my apartment for 14 days, whatever it was. I said, you know what? I'm feeling pretty good. I'm going to do it. I'm just going to put myself out there and start reacting and analyzing some matches. So that's where it started. And it's been going ever since. Awesome. Yeah. And I think you've inspired like a really good community of of people who can kind of gather around the content and to have have a, you know, a player of your caliber being able to directly access the fans like that, I I think is really cool. And I I think you've got a lot of good stuff in store uh, for the YouTube channel. Yeah, thank you. I think, I think, um, you know, kind of reacting and analyzing from a player's perspective, I do a lot of just like, ooh, and ah, like I'm, I'm just a fan of volleyball and all of these players. So it's, it's a good mixture of me just being myself and also, you know, explaining some different techniques and maybe tactics in the game or why a player did that or why the setter did this or different things like that. So, you know, I'm trying to find that balance, but it's been fun to kind of create a community and interact with fans on there as well. Well, yeah, I, I love love everything Eric's been doing. Congratulations on the channel. Uh, you're right. There There is a, a kind of a vacant area in the volleyball scene for English speaking content of that variety. Uh, and especially coming from, like Dan said, a player of your caliber. It's been so cool to get that just that personal look into who you are personally, the way you consume volleyball and the way you react to it. It's sweet. Uh, I think more players should do content like that. I, I, I would like to get more more of the guys sharing their their personal experiences about what it's like to be a professional volleyball player i think it's cool it enhances the way that people consume the game so uh very well done we love your work thank you so much all right eric do you want to try the camera one more time and, and maybe should try and wave goodbye to everyone before we uh <laughs> before we yeah. uh let you go here so it says i'm disabled oh, okay. oh shoot <laughs> you should be able um, to now. Try, try again all right, there we go. Am I back? Uh, yeah, and Rob, I'm just gonna ask you to start your video too, or else it won't Let's work. Let's do it. All right, you're in the wrong squares, but it's fine. Eric, we can see you now, the fans can see you now. <laughs>
uh, Eric, you know, Rob for, for the afternoon. But uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was awesome. Like, man, you should become like, <laughs> you might have a future career as an analyst. You gave some, some great oh. insights today. And uh, yeah, thank you. I think I'm too us. like off the cuff for that. <laughs> but yeah, thank you guys for having me. It was fun to talk some volleyball. You know, not being in Champions League, it's kind of fun to watch from the outside and um, watch it and analyze and talk about it. So thanks again for having me. Hey, you heard it here first. Uh, Rob and Eric commentary duo Olympics 2032. I don't know. <laughs> I love it. I'm in. Let's do it. it. I'm in. <laughs> All right. Bye, Eric. All right. Thanks, Thank you guys. so much, See Eric. You. Talk to you soon. Bye. All right. Rob, that was a great conversation we heard there. Uh, Eric Shoji getting some insights straight from the source. What did you think? Uh, so, sorry, Rob, uh, your, your audio is cut out here. I'm just going to um, fix it. One second. Sorry about that, guys. Um, all right. It should be working now. All right. I, I just turned off my video. Okay. Uh, no, it's not. It's just a matter of uh, the output on, on my computer. Oh. So, so your video is okay. good. Let's leave the video on. The connection's great now. Of yeah, course, yeah. it wasn't working at I the like, beginning, but it's fantastic now. Of course. <laughs> I like when the people can see me. It's all lovely. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. I wish you could have seen Eric as well, um, but we're, we were still glad to have him uh, be a part of the show, at least in, uh, in the capacity he could. Yeah, that was cool. We'll, we'll hopefully be able to keep doing that with more guests and get everything, all the details worked out. Uh, that was very cool. I think that was a huge value add. Uh, Eric was great. I'm, I'm happy to get to know him a little bit and hear his thoughts on the volleyball world because he's so he's so well informed and he's so connected. That was, that was really cool. All right, Rob. So that's we got to fly through the rest of it here. Guys, the next uh, 20 minutes will be packed full of Champions League women and CV Cup. So so strap yourselves in. Which match do you want to talk about first? Let's run it. Uh, just the order I have them up on my screen. Let's do Novara Fenerbahce. Novara Fenerbahce. All right. Okay. Give me give me your one minute analysis here, Rob. All right. So this is one of the several examples in all of Champions League, but especially the women's side, where a team only had to win two sets to advance, and uh, Novara convincingly. 25-16, 25-18, the first two sets, they advance in, in really impressive fashion. And then the rest of the match is, you know, just kind of a formality. Um, Novara is legit. They are so, so, so legit. Uh, they, <laughs> The matchup that they're going to get in the semifinals is going to be unbelievable. I'm so impressed with Micah Hancock, Haley Washington, uh, Smarzek, Herbots, the, the the whole crew. They're they're pretty complete. I don't really think they have that many weaknesses. Uh, they're executing at a pretty high level right now, and um, they they took care of a Fenerbahce team that wasn't that didn't have that extra element to score points that they kind of needed outside of Melissa Vargas. So uh, credit to Navarra for their strength in the matchup. All right, show, hey show. Uh, what, uh, show said, "I'm sad they didn't ask my question." Well, sorry, what was your question? Well, maybe we can ask it to Eric outside the show, and he can he can answer. Um, he but, he wanted he wanted us to, Eric to, to say his dream team of world volleyball players. Uh, that, that's that's yeah. quite the question. But we'll yeah, that, we'll that, get him. I don't not sure if we had time for that one. Sorry, sorry, show, but yeah, we'd love to have we'll you get him on that here. one. Um, yeah, so Navarra's come together pretty nicely. Oh, this is a long match. Navarra's uh, come together very nicely, I think. I think they're kind of peaking at the right time. Fenerbahce's not an easy team to dispatch as easily as they did. And, you know, on paper, I, I feel like they're finally in practice looking as good as they are on paper. But the only thing is, I feel like their wins are still a little unconvincing. Like, even though they beat Navarra pretty soundly, the attack efficiency wasn't that good. There weren't a lot of, uh, the reception efficiency wasn't that good. Still a lot of errors. Um, I don't know if I'm fully convinced by this Navarra team, unfortunately. Okay. Well, uh, any lack of conviction will obviously be put to the test in the yes, semifinals in sure. the most serious possible way. <laughs> All right. How Which about... we can move on to immediately, I think. Yeah, for sure. Uh, to the semifinal match or to the Canegliano-Scandici quarterfinal? If you just want to give... Canegliano-Scandici. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. So the, the, after you and I had the last show, Dan, we talked about the three, two Canigliano Scandici win. And we kind of, we both brought up the fact that it could kind of go one of two ways. Either Scandici could take that three, two loss, which they easily could have won that match and say, you know what? We're in this. We have confidence. We're going to come back and continue to play the way that we're playing. We understand the matchup. We understand what works. We're going to come back. We're going to win this match. Or the other option was Canigliano could say, oh man, we really got pushed. We didn't play our best volleyball. Now that we know the matchup, now that we're a little more comfortable, we're going to assert our dominance as the best club team in the world. And we're going to win this match easily. And sure enough, 3-0, 25-20, 25-17, 25-20. So that is the outcome that that occurred out of those two potential options. Uh, Definitely a valiant effort from Scandici, but the fact that they let those opportunities in the first leg slip away was there, there was no way they were going to be able to come back from that against a team like Canigliano. Yeah, they definitely needed that first win. And man, it was so close. Exciting. I mean, all credit to Canigliano for holding on like that, even when they didn't have their best day. But yeah, against against Canigliano, that is tough. Um, Salim Alcon, just quickly going back to the other one, it said Novara caught Fenerbahce in their worst form. And yeah, we all know Fenerbahce was a better team than what they showed against Novara. But that's the Champions League. Like, it, it's so Absolutely. brief. Absolutely. You play... You play the quarterfinals two matches in two weeks. That's nothing in the scheme of volleyball. So yeah, uh, unfortunately, one 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 bad set in the Champions League can can throw you off. That's how competitive it is. Um, but exactly right. Team. You've got you've got to you've got to be a great team. You've got to be playing your best. You've got to peak at the right time. And then also you might have to get a little bit lucky, like with draw or with a couple plays going your way. It, the, the margin is just so narrow, like a knife's edge separates winning Champions League from like Lube Chivudinova, for example, going out in the quarterfinals. Like that team could have won the tournament. Sure. They lost Golden Set 16-14. Like you never know. That's that's what makes Champions League so awesome is sure. how close is that the the tiniest of margins can be the difference in everything about the tournament that's what i love about it so much for sure for sure and but one match where it wasn't that close uh thank you thank you (laughs) versus police and i you know i said on the show like i'm actually a pretty big fan of police i talked to Jovana brakocevic before the tournament i liked the the form they were coming into it with i thought they actually had like maybe not win but have a decent chance of uh of putting up a fight and Against Faki Faki Stepel, you can't give them any momentum at all. And Polizze didn't start off well and just let Faki Faki roll them over. Wow. Yeah, this this was as lopsided as you're probably ever going to see a, a two-match series in the quarterfinals. Like, the the first match was was convincing. Very, very convincing. And obviously, we knew that all Vakif Bank had to do was win two sets. And... They kept long. their foot on the gas. It did not take long. This is a 71 minute match. The entire match was just barely over an hour. Maybe the fastest I've ever seen. Uh, ridiculous, convincing for Vakif Bank. And Dan, I want you to coin the pun for the whole world here on the show. I want you to tell them how you will refer <laughs> to your pick, your pick to win this tournament. Yeah, Tell so <laughs> guys, guys, I have a new word for for uh, Vakifek Istanbul. Their best player, the lovely, incredibly athletic, strong, dominant Isabel Hawk. Vakif Bank, we're now going to refer to on the show as Hawkif Bank Istanbul because that's how good she is and it rhymes. So I'm a huge fan of it. You heard it here first. Hawkif Bank Istanbul advances to the semifinals. <laughs> All right, let's move, let's move on from that one, Rob, and go, go right to the Agreed. Busto. <laughs> Go right to the Busto, uh, Busto match here versus Achetsabatsi, which I, upset of the quarterfinals, for sure. Yes? Maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah th- it was the only one that I would that I would consider an upset uh, just based on seeding coming in. So we talked about the first matchup, Achetsabatsi missing some players, just feeding Tiana Boscovic every ball that she could handle. Um, Busto winning 3-1. And actually, that, that fourth set in the first leg was very important because if it had gone to five then the advancement criteria for the second leg would have been totally different. But anyway, Ikshashi Basi gets most of their players back for the second leg. Uh, Jordan Thompson was back. Chiaco Bogu was back. So more offensive options. And just look at the score lines for this. Like we knew that all Busto had to do was win two sets. 
but the, they did win the first two sets, but they were 25-23, 25-22. It was incredibly close. And even the next two sets, just to like finish the match, because you got to finish the match, were also incredibly close. This is a really cool matchup, and it's kind of a what-could-have-been story for Ixhasi Basi if they hadn't been missing those players in the first leg, what they could have done to create a little bit more drama in the second leg. But Busto Arcicio, the fact that they are in the semifinals of all of Champions League is insane. Yeah, it's in, it's insane. The, the the run that they're on is unbelievable. The hottest team in all of volleyball right now by far. It's amazing. Yeah, they're doing a really good job. And I mean, we, we've been taught, we've been, I feel like we've been following them a little bit throughout this entire run. Of course, we've got Alexa Gray from Calgary, Canada, doing an incredible job, Jordan Poulter setting, Fran Francesca Piccinini, who is, you know, what if she wins her, I think it's eight or ninth Champions League title. That's incredible. Um, but I mean, I, I look at the roster before the season, they were not expected to be this, in this position. So it's very no. impressive where they have gotten to. But Rob, Busto Rizzizio losing the other night against uh, Caneliano. What do you think of that? Well, the, uh, I don't think very much of that because of, of all the teams to put a stop to a miraculous run. It would be the team that is on that same run times 10. Uh, <laughs> Caneliano with more than 50 matches in a row won. Like Busto, as, as much as they as they had a great run, for, what is it, 14 matches, 15 maybe, uh, which is amazing. Um pales in comparison to Canagliano's 50. So uh, that was that was going to be a very difficult matchup to continue their run. But it doesn't it doesn't change how I feel about Busta going into the semifinal. Again, their their like legitimacy as a truly top tier team is going to be put to a very serious test. Yeah, for sure. And a couple of people in the chat, Joey and Melisa asked, why was Thompson in a, a, a Gobu missing? They actually only missed the first match, but they were it's a combination of in, uh, sickness and injuries unfortunately bad timing for them but they they were available in the second match but it just didn't they started the first set but maybe it's because they were still not at 100 percent. but unfortunately it didn't do much to uh improve improve the chances yeah it was a shame and however these matches ended up being really good uh despite yeah, that sure. they were very for competitive sure. we talked about the crazy uh, go, go watch the last European volleyball show to hear all of our breakdowns on the first leg of Champions League. But talked about that a lot. Uh, this is this is a good series. It really was. All right, Rob, let's do our semifinals picks. Which one do you want to start with? All right. Uh, so Canigliano Novara, um, correct me. That's a rematch of the Super Finals two years ago, right? Of course it is. With uh, one key difference. I mean, a lot of players will switch, but Pali on <laughs> on opposite teams this time. Slight, slight difference. Yes, uh, that is a very important difference to change which team the best player <laughs> in the world is playing for. Yeah. Uh, Ooh, I've, cool. I've got, I've got, oh yeah, I've, I've got Canigliano. I've got him, uh, three one three one, over Novara. I'm going three zero three one. I, Canigliano maybe slowed down a bit, but I feel like they know this Novara team well. There's going to be no surprises here. I mean, unless like Britt Herbutz goes in like a insane service run, I don't see it being that close. Yeah, this this is just an execution test. That this is this is a test of can you get to a matchup that you know and straight up outplay the other team in a known matchup. That's exactly what it's going to come down to. And there isn't a, a, there are not a whole lot of teams on the planet that can out execute Canegliano at their peak. Yeah, and a couple uh, people in the chat, Rock addicted, Caneliano, Monza tomorrow is going to be a good match. Fully agree. Monza, a, another team like Agreed. Gusto, maybe not as high expectations in a team that's not like traditionally dominant in the uh, Liga Valley Femenile, but uh, have, have had a really good season so far and one of our CV Cup teams. So yeah, that's going to be a good match. Excited for that one. So Rob, do you want to talk about uh, the second one? Probably probably a pretty interesting match here, back you think. So. Interesting, interesting matchup, but I'm I'm afraid that the Cinderella story of Busto Arcicio may be coming to an end. Um, I can't possibly pick against the newly coined Hockif Bank at this point. Hockif Bank, um, Istanbul. I've I've got them three zero three one, advancing to the finals to set up the matchup that we have all been waiting for. Yeah, I'm same with me. I'm going. I think I'll go three zero three zero. Hockif Bank. I mean. It's it's incredible volleyball. It's just so like 
It really is, man. It's I don't know what so the, the adjective is. It's so ruthless. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, when did we say Vacuum Bank versus uh, Canaliano? Like, I think I the like very first that, episode of this show, for sure, at least, and and before, yeah, the podcast that we had done before the show even started. I think the whole world has been waiting for this potential uh super finals matchup on the women's side and both dan and i would be shocked if that's not what we got yeah um ezekiel moreno sorry if i, I didn't say that right in the chat says he has a feeling busta will shock us in, oh. okay i i i hope that he joins the chat if he's right after yeah. that semifinal. anyone anyone in the chat also thinks busta will win i'd love to hear from you guys too maybe a reason? I don't know. <laughs> that that'd be good as well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that that that's what we do on the show is we we back up our takes. And, and Rock Addicted said Canelio and Navarro will also play a match each other this Sunday. So yeah, it's some freak amazing matches in women's volleyball over the next uh, few days. Rock Addicted, thank you for highlighting those for everyone there. And Great Rob, point. I think I think that's enough Champions League talk today because we, <laughs> we talked over an hour so far. So let's go over, because I heard a lot of people talking about this earlier on, the CEV Cup men's finals. Do you want to go over that quickly here? Yes. So it is, in fact, the Russian Derby that we expected. However, getting there was was a lot spicier than we thought. Um, Masek out of Belgium, beating Zenit St. Petersburg 3-0 in the second leg, and then losing a golden set. What was it? 1816 or something crazy uh incredibly close yeah 1816 but sure enough uh dinamo moscow zenit st petersburg we just had eric shoji talking about those two teams in russia this year dinamo moscow first place in the russian league which is an amazing achievement and zenit st petersburg right up there close in the top three or four teams in, in all of russia um there's there are some some roster storylines coming in. Is Oriol Kamejo healthy? Is Viktor Tupolatayev healthy? Is Svetan Sokolov healthy? Um, who knows? So the first leg of this is on the 17th, which I believe is Tuesday, Wednesday, Wednesday. Uh, the 17th. Wednesday and yeah, <laughs> I think the 17th is Wednesday. I figured it out. And so the the nice thing for Moscow, like we talked about before, is that they have three foreigners on the roster, and in CEV competition, they'll be able to play all three: uh, Sokolov, Sam Daru, and Lori Kerminen. And some really if, if good If they're all players. healthy, they will be able to play all three. Agreed. Yeah, huge players. So these teams know each other well. Uh, slightly different, you know, setting in CEV Cup instead of Russian League. But again, it's like I just said about Kanellian Navarra, it's a test of who can execute the best in a known matchup. And so these matches are going to be awesome. The first one Wednesday, we'll be able to talk about the first leg on the show next week. So I'm excited to watch this. Yeah, for sure. I mean, these. I mean, for those of you guys who don't know, Dynamo Moscow is really like an incredible team this year. Could have easily been uh, semifinals Champions League. They're a top team in Russia, as Eric mentioned. Only two losses. And, and Zenit St. Petersburg, I don't know. They For me, they haven't looked as good. And especially against uh, Mosaic, like it wasn't an easy road as people in the chat are pointing out for Zenit St. Petersburg to get to the finals. Well, St. Petersburg didn't didn't have half their starters. St. Petersburg didn't have half their starters. That's true, they had that's true. No Kameho, no Polataev. I don't think Antoine Brizard played. Uh, Brizard was obviously Brizard a substantial was downgrade to their, oh, he was. I was about to make fun of you for your love of Dmitry Kovalev. <laughs> I was but, like, uh, of course we've, they have a, we've strong, done that before. a strong backup as well. <laughs> Yeah, they didn't have their whole team. Um, hopefully, they, that both of these teams meet at their at their full form because that's the matchup that the CEV Cup Finals deserves. So uh, we'll see Wednesday. Put it on your calendars, guys. That's going to be a match to watch. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, that I mean, coming back from fourteen ten to uh, eighteen sixteen, uh, presented St. Petersburg was pretty crazy. And uh, just one crazy. more one more thing, like yeah, Zenit St. Petersburg, the outside hitters with no Oriel Camejo, and I don't know what happened to Igor Kluka this year, but he is. He is not the same guy. Um, Should have stayed with Eric Shoji. Exa ex exactly. <laughs> he, need, he needs Eric Shoji setting him up. Um, Emilio Hammer asks, uh, when is the debate starting? Um, uh, or when is Champions League debate starting? We already talked about that. So Emilio, you can check out that. We talked about it with Eric Shoji. So uh, check it out. The recording of this will be posted on YouTube after. Um, and it'll... Uh, Ildar Zabarov points out, yeah, Sokolov uh, injured. 
uh, going over on his ankle might not be available for the game. So that's that's what I've been game. wondering is if he's going to play and if he does, what percentage of his maximum will he be at? I don't know the answer. Uh, that's why we have more informed people in the chat to tell us <laughs> these things. Yeah. And w- quickly, before we move on, what do you think Romanus uh, Shkulevacius, who is the backup opposite? N- any thoughts on him? None. I have never heard that name before. So okay. uh, hopefully we will get to get to learn about him quickly if Sokolov can't play. Uh, n- regardless of who he is or what his capabilities are, it would be a downgrade from Sp- from Sp- Svetan, excuse me, Sokolov, a player who I love. So we'll see. For sure. And yeah, he's he's serviceable, but nothing special. I think there were a couple of people in the chat. I, I'm not as high as you guys, uh, maybe on, on Roman is there. All right, last topic for today. Monza versus Galatasaray Istanbul in the CV Cup women. We already yeah, mentioned so Monza. Monza yeah, we just talked about Monza on the women's side. A very, very good Italian team. Are they second or third in Italy right now? They're up there. I, th- I, I want to say third. I want to say third. But. Yeah, I think it's Canegliano, Novara, then Monza. That, that team is good. They're really good. And Galatasaray, who lost a 3-2 like crazy barn murder to Bizias from France in the first leg of the semis, came back and beat him 3-0 to advance. So uh, this is going to be a good matchup too, but I've got to pick Monza if you had to make me pick right now. Yeah, I have to too, considering that they're doing so well in a really competitive league. And I mean, Galatasaray is doing fine, but not not on the same level. Um, I mean, Hannah Ortman is a player who I love on Monza. I actually got to see her play and interview her a few times in uh, last January 2020 for the Olympic qualifying tournament that Germany was like, looked like they were going to win and qualify for the Olympics. Unfortunately, uh, running into a very good Turkish team and losing in the finals, finals there, Lise van Heck, the Belgian opposite, doing a great job there. And another Belgian, uh, Laura Harriman. Uh, yeah, just really solid foreigners, I have to say, for uh, for Mons. And I feel like all three of those players are having like career years for them. Agreed. Yeah, I think it's just one touch of class slightly above where Galatasaray is right now. Uh, however, this this finals does feature, I think, pretty clearly the two best leagues in the world on the women's side, uh, which we've seen all throughout Champions League. But I love the fact for both CEV Cups, men's and women's, that the teams that are playing in the finals are so good. It really legitimizes that competition and brings just a new level and intrigue and, and you know, number of followers and attraction to those matches. I think it's awesome for the game. Like a team of Bones' caliber, a team of Dinamo Moscow's caliber playing in the finals of CV Cup is great. Yeah, for sure, guys. Never sleep on CV Cup because if you guys were watching fourth round Champions League matches, totally. these, are, totally. these are better teams for the most part. Um, and yeah, all these matches, Eurovolley TV, only five euros for the next month. So I would definitely hop on that. Obviously, check if you can watch in your country first. And YouTube, some of them will be on YouTube. We'll have highlights for you guys. So we're covering the CV Cup quite intensely over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, uh, Eurovolley TV is a no-brainer. If, if, if you can watch it in your country, it's an absolute no-brainer. If you like volleyball and you want to consume the next couple of weeks of Champions League and CV Cup and Eurovolley later this year, all that stuff is there. So uh, that is a slam dunk subscription, if you ask me. It's great. All right, guys. If you have any questions, ask them in the chat now before we uh, stop the show while I kind of explain a couple, a couple new things going on next week. Um, and once again, apologize for the connection issues and audio issues at the beginning of the show. First time with a guest, as you know, from if you guys remember from the first time of the show, there's sometimes some, uh, some is- uh, technical issues on the show. But uh, next We're week... We're learning. It's okay. Next week, Rob, we are doing a new segment of the show called The Debates, where me and Rob will pick a topic and go head to head arguing either side and you guys in the chat will decide who the winner is. And I would love to hear any suggestions you guys have for a debate like this. So please let us know, DM the CV, comments on this video, let us know right now, whatever you want, uh, let us know. Cause we, we need some good topics and you guys know me and Rob, we, we love to argue. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Me too. That's going to be a great segment. That's that's totally going to be a hit. I can't wait to see what the first topic is. 
Yeah, uh, just a couple uh, Challenge Cup guys we'll get to next week because the episode is running a little long today. Um, will Champions League semifinals be on YouTube? As usual, some of the matches will be on YouTube, and, but to watch all of them, you, you do need a Eurovolley TV subscription. But again, uh, like we said, five euros, not, not too bad. Or, or check out who, uh, who holds the games in your, in your country. If you're in Italy or Poland, uh, you might be able to find a local broadcaster who's, who's playing the matches. And if there's no more questions, everyone, I, I, think that's, uh, I think that'll do it for today. What do you think, Rob? I think that's a show. I think that's a great show. Uh, we got Eric Shoji on, which was phenomenal. Uh, we worked through some issues, but we got some great content out of him, some great commentary and analysis, and I'm super happy that we got him on the show. Uh, Georgie says, can you create a team from players who played in that century but have not played for the same team or nation? Wow, uh, that's a hard one. Maybe we can do that for next week. That would be... We we have to do our homework yeah, on that. Exactly, that might be a good debate. Actually, we like each pick our team, and then the chat decides. That would be a pretty good debate. Who uh, who will get it? Um, all right, Rob. Thank you once again. Yeah, for, maybe we can do that for next week. But that that's one for homework. All right, Rob. Thank you for joining. Thanks everyone for tuning in today and 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 staying with us <laughs> through our technical issues. But uh, we'll see you here Friday. March 19th, 5 p.m. on the CV YouTube Volleyball channel. Everyone watch some Champions League this week.